Hello and welcome. I'm joined on NDTV today by author Amitav Ghosh. His writings are especially fascinating because of the insights he offers on these times, on the changing world and planet around us. Mr. Ghosh's latest book, The Nutmeg's Curse, Parables for a Planet in Crisis, encapsulates many of the key challenges and debates we face today, written of course in the backdrop of both a pandemic and the reality of a climate change emergency. Amitav Ghosh, thank you so much for joining me on NDTV. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be uh, speaking with you today. Well, your book is a fascinating read, and I think really the perspectives it offers as in this last one and a half years that we've lived through is uh, really an eye-opener. Just taking some of the themes first, and I think for us in India, of course, especially interesting is what you've written about India, and I, the words you've used where you talked about an ideology of rapaciously extract, extractivist nationalism. Now, extractivist nationalism is an interesting turn of phrase. How would you, what was the, what was the thinking behind this? Well, I think in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, starting with the so-called reforms of the early 90s and uh, really accelerating, you know, uh, more and more in the last few years through the uh, 2010s and now uh, we've seen a wholesale adoption of a certain mode of uh, extractivist capitalism, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, where really the whole idea is to just, con uh, you know, consume uh, uh, resources uh, that are buried in the, um, uh, in the earth. Now, you know, it's important to remember that not all capitalism uh, works in this way. Now, this is essentially a sort of Anglophone model of capitalism, if you like, but there are many other iterations of capitalism. You know, East Asian capitalism, for example, mm -hmm. was not resource in intensive. It was labor intensive, and it was education intensive. You know, as in Japan and uh, South Korea and so on. But the model we have uh, adopted is uh, essentially this uh, Anglophone model of just dig everything up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, the people who are really paying the price are the people who live on the, in those forests and on those lands. Their livelihoods are devastated. They're losing everything. They're being shunted off uh, their, uh, their historic territories. Uh, in so many ways, it's just uh, a kind of disaster for, uh, for forest peoples. More and more what uh, writings by even authors like yourself or by, what, or by activists would have been called alarmist two years ago. I think the COVID pandemic has changed the perspective that many people have on how we actually inhabit, interact with the world, the environment, the habitat around us. Do you feel it's something which should be lasting or do you think that really with the systems of power in place and just looking again at India where, you, you know, historically we've seen also, you've talked in the book also at Mahatma Gandhi's uh, say principles where uh, his ashrams, etc. said examples or almost were modern of an Indian template. And the reforms model, which is introduced by various governments, seems to have completely turned its back on that. Do you think we're seeing any change or a shift now after the pandemic? No, I don't see any change at all. If anything, one sees uh, an acceleration. Mm -hmm. You know, and this has actually been historically the case with epidemics. You know, I mean, um, uh, some people, uh, it's sometimes been said that maybe uh, the pandemic uh, or an epidemic will make people do things differently. But in fact, historically, what's always happened is that epidemics and pandemics and so on lead to enormous uh, acceleration in what people were always doing. I mean, for example, uh, the uh, terrible uh, cholera epidemic of 1918. Uh, in America, it was followed by the Jazz Age, uh, you know, a huge sort of uh, acceleration in, uh, 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 in, uh, of the 20s. So I, I think we are, in fact, seeing something like that. I mean, uh, the, the announcement of... Uh, uh, more and more uh, coal mining licenses being given out in the forests and so on. Uh, I, I don't see any uh, change for the better. <coughs> and of course, uh, because it, that's that uh, the clash is said between development models and the belief that this development model is one that works uh, for India or others. Because of course, in the recent uh, weeks, we've been looking at what is a possible coal shortage and the immediate impact or the thought is that Without coal, we can't run our factories, we won't have electricity, our cities will be cut off. That's, that's the way the debate is framed. Yes, and the real problem with that is that, uh, you know, uh, the country, corporations, the government haven't moved fast enough to, uh, to create uh, alternative uh, uh, energy sources, you know. 
uh, I mean, that's ob obviously the direction that we should have gone in long ago, 10, 15 years ago. I mean, the writing was on the wall way back then. You know, uh, it's almost uh, six or seven years now that I solarized my house in Goa. Mm -hmm. You can't imagine how difficult it was. You know, um, uh, I, I believe it's somewhat easier in, uh, in Delhi, but solarizing my house in Goa just took, it was incredibly expensive. There were no uh, subsidies of any kind as there are, in, uh, for example, in the United States, which is by no means a, a sort of model of uh, uh, alternative energy adoption. But uh, in India, it's, uh, we've just been very slow to move on that front. Mm -hmm. Though, of course, we're seeing now India perhaps uh, talking of leading a solar alliance, uh, the right words are being said because also in the Paris, uh, Paris commitments, India seems to be ahead in the term. And of course, we say that we, we're not at the stage yet when we can afford to make these, uh, these switches from uh, fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. It's a slow process. It will take time. But this is something the government is committed to. Do you see that happening on the ground? You've talked about, of course, in Goa. But in that sense, India is talking the talk, if not walking it yet. Look, a lot of the talk is just pure greenwashing, you know, governments everywhere. I mean, it doesn't really uh, in the US and Canada, everywhere and in India, governments have become expert at greenwashing. That's really what it is. Uh, uh, they produce these torrents of greenwashing rhetoric. I mean, the world's biggest uh, uh, coal producer, the Adani group is now talking about, uh, you know, alternative energy and so on. I mean, it's actually kind of uh, hilarious. I mean, uh, if it weren't uh, just so incredibly sad, uh, you know, I mean, uh, really, uh, the world is hurtling towards disaster. We can all see that now. And we are unable to stop ourselves. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the we've always believed, so many people have always believed that humans are exceptional in the sense that they can manage their own destinies uh, to some degree. What is perfectly clear now is that that is not the case. Mm -hmm. And it's really, I think, uh, we've been hit because if you've, the recent UN report has pointed out that the climate change emergency is here. It's no longer something which is in the distant future. And we've seen that, of course, in India just these last few days where we've had record-breaking rainfall in Uttarakhand. We've had, uh, again, a record rainfall in North Bengal, in, uh, in Sikkim as well, and in Kerala. So these are devastations that are destroying people's lives. I mean, 50 dead it seems to be just a number we bandy around. Yet... Because these are people, and you talk about that in your book, that the inequities which are inbuilt within countries, within economies, they're, they're not debts which are actually changing policy or economies at all. Yes, absolutely. Uh, look, I mean, uh, at least you're talking about what is happening on the West Coast and in, uh, and in Uttarakhand. But actually, you know, the climate disaster uh, uh, unfolds in many different ways. And one of the ways in which it unfolds most significantly <coughs> uh, is uh, uh, in relation to droughts and heat waves. You know, we hardly ever talk about that, but central, uh, central India, Bundelkhand and so on have been devastated by long-standing droughts. The, uh, these have destroyed the livelihoods of millions of farmers, mm -hmm. you know, who, who become, uh, ultimately migrate to the cities and become a, a kind of floating uh, urban working class. Uh, similarly, uh, saltwater intrusion has destroyed the, uh, the livelihoods of uh, millions of people in the Sundarban, you know, and they too have become essentially migrants who are eking out a living elsewhere. So, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the devastating rains, uh, the Uttarakhand disasters that we've seen in this last year, uh, those are spectacular disasters, so people pay attention to them. But in fact, uh, uh, you know, climate change is unfolding all around us. Uh, it's not a question of having been here now. It's been, uh, it's been with us for uh, 10, 15 years, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I've been writing about it for a long time. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, it's just that now uh, the, uh, the, the devastation is more evident, mm -hmm. you know. No, the, absolutely. And I just want to pick up, and I think you're right, that the climate change is not a story which is a 24-hour headline. It is something which I think we are seeing in the long-term impact. And Hopefully, we'll see changes also uh, coming in as, as well uh, after that on how we deal with it. But just looking at that point uh, uh, you on inequity, which I, in your book you've discussed in some detail, because you pointed out the fact that one, the interesting aspect is often the, it was the developed countries in the West, which seemed almost in a sense um, complacent about the fact that countries, other countries were hit much harder, whether it's in Africa or perhaps uh, parts of Asia, poorer countries. But you've actually pointed out that wasn't the case. And also how... Even within different countries, like in America, racial inequalities actually high, were 
highlighted here and in India you talked about uh, the kind of almost the class uh, divide which showed up in when the lockdown and how migrant workers were left for themselves and uh, middle class Indians were evacuated. If you could just go into some detail on that. Well, you know, I think the pandemic, uh, you know, it's just one aspect of the planetary crisis. It's not, uh, it's not uh, different from the planetary crisis. You know, it's, uh, it's just another, uh, another aspect of it. And uh, uh, that's why I think the pandemic offers us many pointers about what to expect, uh, you know, when climate change impacts uh, unfold even more dramatically than they are unfolding now. And I think what we see really is a dramatic shift I mean, as late as 2019, uh, there was a uh, there was a I think a WHO study of uh, uh, preparedness for pandemics, and it said the countries that are best prepared for pandemics are actually the USA and the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom yesterday had 10 times the number of uh, COVID infections uh, as Germany or Portugal, uh, you know, and similarly with uh, COVID-related deaths. Uh, here in America, again, uh, you know, there was a sort of uh, uh, there was an idea that there would be a technological solution. The technology actually emerged miraculously, uh, these vaccines, but it hasn't solved the problem at all uh, because, uh, you know, so many people in, uh, in America are not willing to take the vaccine. It's become completely politicized. There are deep political divisions and somehow vaccines have become a part of these deep political divisions. Yeah. Well, I think there are two factors, you know, that uh, really influence uh, the way that uh, uh, countries have responded. One is inequality, uh, and the other is social trust. Uh, the countries that have performed worst in this pan in this pandemic, in fact, are countries with very high levels of inequality and very low social trust. So, the United States, Brazil, India, you know, whereas countries that <coughs> Uh, are quite different, uh, uh, you know, uh, especially in Asia, but also in Africa. Vietnam has uh, has performed uh, spectacularly, you know. Uh, Cuba, uh, Cuba actually has shown itself to be incredibly sort of well prepared for these mm -hmm. uh, uh, pla uh, planetary disasters, you know. And I think that's the pattern that we are going to see uh, going ahead, uh, you know. Uh, in fact, one of the really terrible outcomes uh, of this pandemic is that it's actually exacerbated uh, inequalities, far from, uh, you know, everyone being equally affected. Uh, exactly the opposite uh, has, has been shown to be the case. I mean, the way that the lockdown was declared in India, I mean, it's astonishing. I mean, the government clearly didn't seem to know that all our cities are home to millions of migrant workers, you know. Not just our cities, on the west coast, uh, uh, in, uh, in Goa, in the last 10 or 15 years, I've seen a dramatic change uh, in the demography, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the working class of Goa has become overwhelmingly uh, uh, eastern. You know, there are people from, uh, a lot of people from Bengal, but mm -hmm. also a lot of people from uh, Chhattisgarh and Odisha. And a lot of these people are exactly climate migrants, you know. They're leaving because they've lost their livelihoods back home. So... It's, it's astonishing the degree to which uh, the working class in Goa and also in Karnataka, in Kerala, uh, has been transformed. Uh, uh, there are schools, apparently, in Bangalore now where the most spoken language is Bengali, uh, you know. Yes. So how is it possible that, that I can see this, anyone can see these massive demographic changes, but the government is completely either ignorant of them or indifferent. Today at a time, as I said, India, even after the devastating second wave, even after the human exodus we saw from our cities of uh, migrant workers, that today, in fact, India, India's government seems to be saying that, in fact, we've come out of it in a sense. We have managed, uh, we just crossed the 1 billion vaccine doses milestone, the highest in the world after China. So India has managed to control this. It's a triumph of spirit. We've scripted history as the Prime Minister said, and a billion vaccine doses is no small achievement. But yes, but you have to compare it to the size of the population. And look, we are talking about now, look at the devastation we went through earlier this year. Yes. You know, from, uh, from April uh, uh, until uh, uh, basically August, what unfolded in India was a carnage. You know, we will never know how many people died. But certainly it's... it's it may be as much as 10 times the number. Mm -hmm. So what's the point of even saying this now? It's like you're trying to just erase and forget that history. It doesn't matter that you've got people vaccinated now. Why, why didn't this happen earlier? 
why wasn't the stockpile of vaccinations built uh, uh, you know uh, in march or april mm -hmm. you know so that devastation has happened you can't just uh, sweep it under the carpet and say oh all is well now amitav ghosh thank you so much for joining me on ndtv and you. said your book thank really you. essential reading thank you very much thank you, thank you for having me thank you